It's hard to believe that in our journey in our summer on the mount that we are already to chapter 7, but the summer is fading away as is our time in this beautiful message where Jesus all in one occasion brought together some of his most consistent teaching that he taught from place to place time and again and and brought to us such an incredible message that is not only filled with great content on what it means to be a true disciple in obedience, but also Jesus so beautifully applies and illustrates all of this teaching and gives us some great examples of how these things are to look in the daily life of the disciple who's living in obedience to the Lord. And this passage, as we begin chapter 7, is one that in our home we like to quote often, though I don't know we're all, if we're always quoting scripture when we do it. It's, it's a favorite saying in the Costanza home to say, stop judging me, or to call somebody out for judging someone else. And here Jesus begins this chapter with that very topic. You know, many of us are old enough to remember when there were very few options for watching a movie. Some of you remember when the only way to watch a movie was in a theater, and then Later on, though, I never had one of these, but I've heard they existed. You could watch some movies on a reel-to-reel, right? Then others began to own VHS machines or Betamax machines. Then on down the line, we had DVD players, and, and then came Netflix, but not the Netflix that most of our teenagers know, the Netflix which would send you DVDs in the mail. Some of you use that version of Netflix, and now... We just have an endless list of streaming platforms. Not only are there a gajillion streaming platforms, but there are gajillion movies out there. And the more I look through some of the options that are available today, the less I want to even watch any of them. But many of us can remember back in the days when things were simple. That's why I'm so glad that we've hired some millennials and some Gen Z folks to be on our staff to help the older folks like me navigate the new day and age in which we live. And one of those young adults on our staff, Jesse Johnston, recently taught us about what's called the scientific cinema scale, basically ranking whether a movie is great all the way down to whether a movie is terrible. And here's the scale as our younger adults know it. The best, the highest level on the scientific cinema scale is own it, don't lend it, and buy that poster. That's how much you love the movie. The next level is just simply to buy it. If you don't want to buy it, you can just rent it. And if you don't love it enough to rent it, then you can stream it. If you don't feel like streaming it, then just forget it. And I love the last, last category, God hath forsaken us. Because <laughs> there is some really terrible stuff out there for view. <laughs> Movies are one thing. But the truth is, in nearly every part of our lives and culture, right now we are taught to be judges and to be critics. And many of us, perhaps most of us, feel like we're supposed to have an opinion about everything. And not only are we supposed to have an opinion about everything, we're supposed to share our opinions about everything. And we live in this time where that is so true with so many people that all the time it feels like we're surrounded by conflict. In fact, many times it feels like there is no safe topic to talk about, even with your family and your friends. Jesus moves into this chapter dealing with the issue of judging and he reminds us right in the middle of this text that a significant problem we all deal with is hypocrisy all of us have a tendency to do what Jesus describes here to shout about the shortcomings and the failures of others but to whisper about our own to to relish when the shortcomings of others are called out and people are are put on display for everything they've done wrong but when we do something wrong we either hope no one will notice or we pray that they will show us grace jesus digs into that hypocrisy as we turn to chapter seven you'll remember at the end of chapter six jesus was talking about how we handle our worries and our concerns and what it looks like to to seek god in faith when the circumstances of our lives are negative Now in chapter 7, he turns to what we should do when our attitudes are negative. When we have bad attitudes about other people, about their circumstances, about their lives, about their decisions, and how in our hearts 
we ought to do the hard work of self-examination before we place ourselves in the seat of judgment to look down upon and to condescend to others. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned us about our hypocrisy in relation to God. He said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be noticed by them. Because if you do that, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Here, he warns us about hypocrisy in relation to others, to our neighbor, to our brother and sister. And it begins in verse 1 with the command, do not judge. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Now, what do we mean by the word judging? Well, among other things, I would define judging as pronouncing a verdict on another person. Pronouncing a verdict on another person's character or decisions, or if we're honest, even pronouncing a verdict on their very personhood itself. Sometimes we talk about other people in such a way that it almost sounds like we think we're more valuable we have more worth than they do. Sitting in judgment is talking down on someone in such a condescending way that it it even lowers the level of the image of God in them, at least in our own eyes. And listen, judging is also a way that we often tear others down so that we might exalt and elevate ourselves. Jesus says, for the true disciple, do not judge or you too will be judged. And a word that I came across when I was doing a lot of study for this text, especially in scholars from the previous century, was a word that for whatever reason was not in my English classes when I was growing up. I don't ever remember this word in a vocabulary list, but some of you have probably heard it. It's the word sensoriness. Never heard this before. Sensoriousness. See, I didn't even know how to say it right. Sensoriousness is the word. I don't know that word, but I know its root, the word censor, to censor another person. Censoriousness means something like to to look upon someone with harsh judgment, to look upon someone in a condemning fashion. And that root word censor, or, or we might use the word in our culture, cancel, is something that we're all too familiar with. And some people blame the left for canceling or the right for canceling, but the truth is, This is really sad. There are many Christians today who are canceling each other, looking to their brother and sister and and canceling them out of their lives, shutting them out, saying to them, you have nothing good to say to me, not over issues that are primary issues in the Bible, but more often than not about things that are simply on the level of opinion and preference. Censoriousness condescending, looking down on others. I love the way John Stott said it. He said, we are in no position to stand in judgment on our fellow sinners. When it comes to being the judge of humanity, we are not qualified to sit on that bench. I love that. Our role is not to be the judge. God alone has set himself in that place. God alone is the one who can truly pronounce judgment because of sin on humanity and yet even God who can sit in the seat of judgment and does and will sit in that seat he chooses to look upon us with compassion with grace and with mercy and he chooses to forgive our sins when we ask and when we repent and when we turn away from them so Jesus says in the same way you judge others you will be judged and the measure you use will be measured to you now i'm going to be transparent with you we all struggle with judgment i'm a person that struggles with that at times too a few weeks ago i had put that on display when a group of us went to our denomination's annual meeting we went to the annual meeting of our convention of our denomination And if you've ever been to the annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention, there's some great music, there's some great preaching, but most of what happens are are business sessions. And with more than 10,000 people in the room, it's like a church business meeting on steroids the whole time, okay? And in every family, because you know, as the body of Christ, we're a family, in every family you have the crazy uncle, right? 
Well, the crazy uncles have a lot to say at these meetings, and in many of those sessions, it's an open microphone session where people can come up. And so we were in the second or third session, and my oldest son, Aiden, finally tapped me on the arm, and he said, Dad, you may not realize it, but the groans and the sighs and the little comments you're making that you think are just to yourself, everyone around you can hear you (laughs) making those noises. In fact, at one point, a person had come up to the microphone for like the fourth or fifth time, and I guess out loud I said, oh, brother. And, and somebody in, in, in front of me turned around and looked at me, and then they smiled in agreement, but still I said, again, I didn't mean for that to be so loud. I apologize. I have to learn these lessons regularly, as I'm sure you do. And yet, Jesus here is addressing the tendency that we all have at times to set ourselves up as the judge and the jury and perhaps even the executioner. And yet we would never want to face the measure of our own judgment. We're okay to think of others facing that level of our judgment, but when it comes to our mistakes, our failures, our shortcomings, we hope we experience grace. Both judging and not judging can become habits in our lives. I want to say that again because I think it's really important. Both judging and not judging can become habits in our lives. Like any habit, it takes practice. It takes building up our muscles. It takes changing our routines and putting focus and intention into the ways that we think and teach ourselves to act. Jesus is saying for the true disciple, the habit is not judging but not judging, just as God has demonstrated for us. And I love the way, again, Jesus so often illustrates things for us. In this case, he uses another parable to really give us a clear picture of what it looks like when we put ourselves on the seat of judgment. Why do you look, Jesus says, at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that's in your own eye? Some of your translations will will say a speck of sawdust or maybe they'll say something like a chip of wood or maybe you have a a really good classical translation that says a moat a moat in your eye in any case the the word the picture is of the the smallest piece of wood that's mostly like an irritation in your eye as opposed to a plank which would be used to build a ship or to build the the structure the foundation of a building Jesus is giving a very stark contrast here, one that's even laughable, because no one could have a plank in their eye, and yet what Jesus is saying is when we overlook our own personal sin and only look in judgment upon the sins of others, it's like we're missing the most obvious thing that God would have us see, and our focus is where it ought not be, on others and not on doing the hard work ourselves, the hard work of introspection and self-examination where we look into our own hearts. We trust the Lord to help us examine our own hearts. And we say to him first, before anything else, Lord, make my heart right and clean. That's why Jesus says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all this time there is a plank in in your own eye? Jesus says, first, take the plank out of your eye. Then you will see clearly if you really care about your brother, if you really care about your sister, if you want to edify them, if there's something in their life that is of concern to you, and I would add, if you have earned the place with your brother or sister to speak the truth to them in love, first, make sure that your heart is clean and make sure the plank is out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to offer to your brother or sister what you believe they need. Jesus says if we don't do that, we're hypocrites. And remember, we we talked about this earlier in the sermon. Who were the hypocrites in the ancient world? The Greek word is actually hypocrite. It's the same word. And it described actors who were in plays and performances who in, in front of people were masquerading, were playing a character, were playing a role, hiding their true selves, their true identity behind a mask. In the same way, Jesus says, if you don't take the plank out of your eye and all of your focus is on the speck in your brother or sister's eye, you too are a hypocrite. You're a pretender. 
You're an impersonator. You are not being who you say you are. This is a Christ-like love that Jesus describes that we ought to have for our brother or sister. And it reminds me, as we've talked about several times in the past, of what is the most consistent description of God that we find in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. The most common description of God and His character throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, you'll find it time and again in each one of the sections of the Old Testament Scripture. It goes like this. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Jesus is saying with even with all of the sinfulness of your character and your being, if that is how your heavenly Father looks upon you, grace, compassion, mercy, love, righteousness, how much more in a Christ-like way ought you look to your brother and sister with the same attributes? Now, as we move on into the next verse, it's important to point out here that this is not instruction from Jesus to completely turn off our critical thinking, okay? Jesus is not saying here with this idea of not judging that we should never call sin, sin. That we should never call evil, evil. That we should never call darkness, darkness. No, in fact, Scripture is very consistent on the opposite side that we should, especially in difficult times like we're living in, seek God regularly for discernment so that we will know what is right. That we'll know how to, to make sense of all of the mixed messages we receive. And when, when so often it's so hard to know what is actually true and trustworthy. To seek God for discernment so that we might know. Jesus is not saying to turn off our critical thinking. Or seeking the Holy Spirit to help us know what is true and what is false. But instead he's just reminding us. That self-examination is always our first step. And always more valuable than condescension and condemnation of others. In fact, it's critical thinking that I think Jesus turns to next. In what it has to be sort of the out of place verse in this part of the passage. I've just given the, the, the phrase to go with verse 6. Do not waste that which is sacred. Jesus uses much more vivid language, doesn't he? To describe what he's talking about here. Do not give to dogs what is sacred, and do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, and then turn and tear you to pieces. Now, what do we do with verse 6? Because Jesus just finished telling us not to judge, and now it sounds a little bit judgmental to call people pigs and to call people dogs. To the Jewish listener, pigs were always an automatic clue that uncleanness was the conversation. To the Jewish person, pigs were seen as both unclean to eat and to touch. A great example of this comes from Proverbs eleven twenty two: A beautiful woman without discretion is like a ring of gold in a pig's snout, is what the proverb says. That's the kind of language that, that the Bible consistently uses when pigs are used as the example we have similar language in English, like the old farmer's advice. Never wrestle a pig because you both get dirty and the pig likes it, right? <laughs> we usually talk about pigs in the same manner. Likewise, to throw something to mongrel dogs was to know that they would tear it to pieces, devour it with utter haste and with no care. So what is Jesus saying? Well, he's saying don't take that which is pure and good that which is precious to you and throw it away on those who would not appreciate it only seek to destroy it or perhaps the best word to use is those who would waste it don't take that which is precious and holy and righteous and sacred and good and throw it away on those who only seek destruction another way that I make sense of this is with what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said he said don't don't waste too much time on hard-hearted people. Don't waste too much time on hard-hearted people. Here's a way that I've put it into practice in my years in ministry. You can't reason with an unreasonable person. You will spend a lot of energy and time and effort trying to do so. 
you will find yourselves especially these days when when people dig in their heels they've made up their minds their minds aren't going to be changed they're at least in this moment unreasonable unable to be reasoned with about whatever it might be you will spend so much time so much energy maybe even have some sleepless nights and that person is not going to move an inch until they're ready don't try to reason with unreasonable people don't waste too much time on hard-hearted people except i'm going to give you this one exception when it comes to sharing the gospel when it comes to sharing that which is most precious to us the good news of of christ's salvation that sets us free from sin that brings us from darkness into light that brings us and has brought us from death to life that has if we're all honest broken through our hard-heartedness right the good news of the salvation of jesus christ his death on the cross his victorious resurrection the way that he has made it possible that we can come to god personally that's your exception share that with the hard-hearted person share that with the unreasonable person why because ultimately it's only the gospel that can do the work of changing the heart just like it's done for us but jesus says don't judge don't put yourself in that seat look upon your brother as you would want people to look upon you but at the same time at some point if what you're throwing away is going to pigs and to dogs and it's being ruined perhaps it's time to dust off your feet and move on to the next person as we move to the last part of the text some of this probably seems impossible or it seems nearly impossible and i think jesus understood that and that's why he moved into the next section with some words of hope at the very moment where we might think i can't do that this is impossible in the times in which we're living how can anybody truly live this way jesus is saying here as he says in so many other places if you realize that something is lacking ask of your heavenly father who already knows what you need before you ask him and your heavenly father knowing what you need will hear you and he will answer your prayers i would imagine that some of you probably have matthew 7 7 maybe 7 7 and 8 somewhere in your home on the wall or maybe in your office ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks the door will be opened notice the how the intensity of these words increases as jesus goes forward in these verses sometimes we simply just need to ask as james says james 4 2 you do not have because you do not ask god sometimes it's just as simple as going to the lord and asking and those who ask in those situations and circumstances receive but sometimes god wants us to take the next step yes he wants us to ask but he doesn't want us to ask in a manner that is sort of flippant he wants us to dig a little deeper he wants us to seek him he wants us to create some space where it's more than just throwing out the words but we genuinely from our hearts and in the commitment of our lives are seeking him fully when we seek him in that way jesus says we will find him and 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 i can say to you from personal experience whenever i have sought the lord truly sought him with all my heart guess what i found i found him but so many times the biggest barrier to finding god has simply been my unwillingness to seek him completely sometimes we use that word seekers only to talk about a person before they come to faith but i believe we should always be seekers of god it should be a discipline of our lives it should be a description of our character that we are lifelong learners that we have a teachable spirit no matter how old we are and that always we are curious we want to know more about him we want to experience more wonder about just how great our god is and how amazing everything that he's created is for us to experience and we want to be those kinds of people 
for our whole lives. We want to take a listening posture to God. We want to have a listening posture with our brothers and sisters and with our neighbor. And do you know a key word that it takes? A key word that it requires to have all of those things for your life is humility. But if we are willing to live in that way, in humility, to seek God humbly with all of our hearts, we can be lifelong learners. We can never stop growing until the time that either our life comes to an end or Christ returns to the earth. And I don't know about you, but whenever one of those two things happens, I want to be sliding into home plate. I want to be going as fast and as, as best as I ever have as a follower of Jesus. Ask, you'll receive. Seek, and you will find. And then the third most intense level is when we're asking and we're seeking, but all of a sudden we find ourselves standing in front of what appears to be a locked door. And Jesus says that is the moment where you really have to trust God to take the step. Where, where only God from the inside of the door has the ability to open that door. But if you've asked, if you've truly been seeking God with all of your heart, and you're standing in front of a door that you know in your heart is his desire and his will for you, knock on that door, bang on that door, and it will be open to you. It's important to say here as we talked about last week with the verse seek first his kingdom and all of these things will be added to you this is not jesus saying ask and seek and knock and every little desire of your heart will be yours no this is a process as the intensity increases of seeking and searching out god's will and desire for you and when you come up to a door that seems locked but it's god's desire for you to go through it knock on that door and i assure you it will be open to you the best illustration that I could ever give for this is the illustration that Jesus uses. As a parent with children, I know as a parent that, that if I were to give my children everything that they've ever asked for the very first time they asked for it, not only would I be dead broke, but we would have lots of things in our home that we neither need nor have interest in anymore. Any good parent knows that Though we have a desire to give our kids more than we had and as much as we can, it's not good for them. Even if we have the means to give them everything they ask for every time they ask. But no, as parents, we, we want our children to learn some valuable things that will make them more successful in life, will make them better adults, better followers of Jesus. So sometimes to my own kids, when they ask for something, I say, are you willing to work for it? Or I say, are, are you willing to wait? If you'll save up your allowance for a few months, then maybe you'll be able to buy that thing. Or if you don't want to wait that long, I got a lot of jobs around this house that I don't like doing, and I'll gladly let you do some of them for money. I bet your grandma and grandpa have the same thing going on in their house. And we see how much does my child really want it? How strong is that desire? Are they willing to work? Are they willing to wait? And as we ask, seek, and knock, just as we hope our children learn these things, here's what we learn from our Heavenly Father. We learn how to wait. We learn how to work. We learn how to appreciate. And we learn how to trust. How to trust what? That our Heavenly Father is exactly as Jesus describes him here in these verses. He is our Heavenly Father who loves to give good gifts to his children. He's not a prankster. He's not trying to trick us by giving us a stone instead of bread or snake instead of fish. He's not cruel. He's not cold and distant. Our Heavenly Father is fully aware of who we are and where we are. And He knows what we need even before we ask Him. And as James says, again from James, James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. This morning, know, believe, trust. Your heavenly Father is a good, good Father who loves to give good gifts to his children. And he gives us those good gifts as blessings, not just so that we might experience them, but as we move into the very last verse, as we ask, as we seek, as we knock, as the door is open to us and our Father gives us blessings, we then use them as blessings towards others. 
Jesus says, love your neighbor. This is the, the law, the command that sums up all the law and prophets. Love your neighbor through the golden rule. Verse 12 is probably one of the verses from the Bible that is best known all over the world today. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. The golden rule is actually found in many other religions, many other religious writings, and many writings of the ancient philosophers. But in every case except for this one, the golden rule is presented in the negative sense. So rather than as we read it, that, that you would do to others what you would have them do to you, most others use the golden rule this way, do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. Notice how Jesus flips this upside down, and he makes this, listen, he makes this a matter of obedience. It's not just about reaction. It's not just a command like, do no harm. It's not just a command like, do not retaliate. But Jesus is saying, again, for the true disciple, we will choose to do what's right to our neighbor, just as we would have it done for ourselves. We would choose to love our neighbor as ourself. That also, Jesus says, sums up all the law and the prophets. Not just that we will do no harm, but that we will choose and look out for the good of our brother and sister and for our neighbor. And lest we forget, earlier on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus included with our neighbor our enemies. He commanded us, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Yes, here, even do good to those who would not seek to do good to you. These things are hard. Dare I say they seem impossible, especially living in times like ours where we do always feel that pressure, whether it's internal or cultural, to judge, to criticize, and to express our opinion about everything. But if we ask, we will receive. If we seek in these hard, difficult areas of true discipleship, we will find. We will find the Lord as our example to follow. And if we knock, the door will be open to us. And the blessings we receive, the love that we receive, can also be experienced by our neighbor. Because just as our God has been gracious to us, so too we can be gracious to them. True disciples make a habit of not judging others. True disciples realize that we all struggle with hypocrisy. True disciples know that self-examination is always better and comes first before we look down upon others. True disciples know that Scripture continually teaches us to ask God for discernment because true disciples are always seeking God and are always seeking what is good for our neighbor. This morning, as we move to our time of invitation and response, I want to just put those three words before all of us once again. Ask, seek, and knock. Wherever you are this morning, whatever baggage you've brought into this place, this is an opportunity as we have one more time to sing, one more time just you to spend some time before the Lord to ask. Ask God to help you Take whatever that next step is and, and you'll receive. Seek God with all of your heart and even, believe it or not, in this very moment you can see him and find him. Knock and that door that seems to be closed to you will be opened, especially if it's the door to your heart to make you a truer disciple of the Lord. Whatever the Lord is saying to you today, I pray, I challenge, I encourage all of us, may we ask, seek, and knock and believe that our Heavenly Father knows what we need even before we ask. Lord, I thank you today for the teaching of Jesus, but most importantly, I just thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his example. I thank you for his life. Certainly thank you for the teaching that we have recorded of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But also, Lord, we thank you for his death, and we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that you have made a way that even though we are sinners, we can be right with you. Lord, you have made for us a way, a path that we can follow you. 
in obedience and we can be Christ-like. We can be more like you in the things that we do and the attitudes that we have and the way we look upon our neighbor. Today, Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, wherever we are, that you would help us to take the next step of obedience. If there's anyone here who feels like their heart is closed off, Lord, they feel like today all of their life is filled with darkness. I pray in these last moments that you would speak to them so clearly, that you would remind them that you love them, that you would remind them of the cross and all that Christ has done, and Lord, that you would remind them of the victory that you've given us over death and over sin and over darkness. And Lord, would you draw that person so close to yourself that today they would know they hear from you. And would you give that person today who needs to take a step of obedience the courage to take that step and to follow you closely from this day forward. Lord, we give you this time for your glory in Jesus' name.